Hello and welcome to Bar Design Basics. This is Corinne Walenda. I am one of Perlix Regional Sales Managers. And we're going to talk today about why bar design is so critical for optimal profitability as well as mitigation of fatigue for bartenders. All of those things add up to happy bartenders and happy customers and extra profits for you. I'd like to start off this presentation by showing this image. This is a lady named Caledonia Wright, <clears throat> and she's a terrific bartender at a bar called Open Outcry, which is in downtown Vancouver. Should, yourself, should you find yourself in Vancouver, please do visit Open Outcry and uh, see Caledonia Wright. She will make you a hell of a drink. Caledonia and I had a very uh, interesting and spirited discussion about bar design while I was there. Uh, here she is showing off her new Tobin Ellis bartender's cockpit. And she uh, reminded me about a terrific book that I read when I was a young woman called Cheaper by the Dozen. Uh, that is a novel about Frank and Lillian Gilbreth and how they manage their 12 children as well as their business. Now, the two films that were made called Cheaper by the Dozen had relatively nothing to do with the book itself. The Gilbreths were experts in designing workstations for optimal efficiency and lowering of fatigue for factory workers. They were uh, consultants for many companies. Uh, they also own their own building firm and looked at things like bricklayers and, const and other construction workers and determined if they if the uh, employees had some additional tools available to them, as well as uh, setup stations and tables, et cetera, that they were able to work in a far more efficient manner. That has a lot to do with how, think, how we look at things with bar design. Uh, we always want to design bars for, again, for comfort for the bartender, where bartenders are happy, they can be working on, uh, on uh, managing what's going on hospitality wise with the patrons at the bar as well as their fellow workers in the restaurant and uh, be able to make drinks very quickly and get things served in a more efficient manner. So should you have uh, some time, please do check out Cheaper by the Dozen, the book, not the movies, uh, and learn a little bit more about the Gilbreths. Uh, as a matter of fact, Lillian Gilbreth, who far outlived her husband by some 50 years, uh, she ended up becoming a, a professor of uh, industrial design and is very much considered to be the mother of industrial design here in the United States. Pretty, pretty interesting person. So uh, let's start with this. Um, right now it is May 2020, and I think we could all use a drink right now based on what's been going on in the world in the past couple of months. Um, but I'm here to say that, like my friends here at It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, we're all going to want to get together at these bars. Uh, when everything is finished, we still will want to get to these gathering places where we can discuss our lives and see our friends, etc. cetera. Uh, and so do know that we're all in this together. Uh, and my company, Perlick, has been around a very long time, and, and we've seen crazy things like this in our history as well. Bars are the heart of hospitality in any facility, uh, in, in, at any place. Think about it. We go to bars, we meet up with our friends, whether we're going to stay at the bar there and have drinks or move on to another location, or I'll meet you at the bar and then we'll have dinner at the restaurant. Bars are the heart of hospitality. As a matter of fact, I always like to point out that bartenders are in fact some of your best salespeople for any restaurant. Uh, if the bartender is comfortable and has a great setup and is firing on all five cylinders, not only is he or she able to make you a terrific drink as you're waiting for your table, but can also talk to you about what, what your plans are for that evening. Uh, tell you about a couple of the great pieces on the menu that maybe they had at family dinner before the restaurant opened. Taking good care of your bartenders makes a whole lot of sense. So why is bar design so important? I think all of us know this instinctively and in that it's all about profitability. As a matter of fact, um, something perhaps you've heard me say before that I always enjoy repeating is that there's more profit poured at the bar than cooked in the kitchen. 
I'll say it again, more profit poured at the bar than cooked in the kitchen means a lot of profit is, is being generated out of your drink program. Restaurant food is terrific in that it means revenue, it means cash flow, it means people sitting in, in a space. But think about it, when we go out to dinner, no matter how fantastic our steaks or our salmon was, we're not ordering another round of food. But if we are having a great time, perhaps we are ordering yet another round of drinks. So it's important to remember that keeping what goes on in the bar at the forefront of anyone's idea when you're when you're designing a bar or designing a space uh, because it's all about profit a lot of profits going to come out of that sadly a lot of times the bar ends up being an afterthought or something that the architect considered later i'm here to ask you please consider the bar first because that alone could determine the success of that location whether it's a restaurant hotel hotel bar etc one thing that we hadn't really talked a whole lot about before uh, in previous years when I was giving a bar design class, but, uh, but now talk about it all the time is Instagram. Things need to be Instagrammable. Always think about that when you're designing a bar. What is going to be kind of a focal space that you're expecting people to take photos of? For example, on the upper right here, that is an image from a wonderful sports bar called Real Sports. It's in Toronto and it's adjacent to uh, the stadium where the Toronto Maple Leafs play. And yes, indeed, that bar top is designed to look like ice. Uh, what it is, it's actually uh, two long slabs of fused glass that are illuminated underneath. You can actually achieve that same effect using other materials. There are some uh, man-made materials. Uh, Avonite is one that comes to mind that are translucent and look really terrific when they're illuminated underneath. Uh, that idea of illumination at the bar uh, you're going to see that throughout this presentation and it is a very first of all it's very Instagrammable and frankly it also makes us all look good because it gives a nice glow to not only the cocktails but to the patrons as well the lower left is an example of what we're seeing in a lot of design right now I call it fresh and clean and green uh, meaning you've got lots of natural light uh, lots of greenery Perhaps it's an area, this is a rooftop uh, restaurant actually that opens up to uh, the roof during warm winter month, warm summer months here in Chicago. And at, that is absolutely on trend right now. Uh, so be sure to include some greenery or biophilic uh, uh, components in your next design. Uh, and then over here in the upper left-hand corner, that's a photo I took of uh, a really fantastic cocktail bar near Wrigley Field. Uh, it's called Mordecai Browns. And frankly, in my opinion, as a Chicagoan, it's the only uh, adult place to get a great smart cocktail that's near Wrigley Field. Most of the bars around Wrigley are sports bars, as you can imagine, uh, but this place is definitely designed for adults and the lighting fixtures here are just spot on i think they echo a little bit of baseball and i also like to point out to folks the um very simple but elegant uh space that they have to store all of their beautiful cocktail glasses very smart and uh definitely needed because one cannot stack those glasses anymore but anyway uh check that out though should you come to my town for this game Here's another shot from Instagram. Uh, this is from a terrific restaurant called Goat Duck Duck Goat here in Chicago. And I apologize if I'm saying here in Chicago a lot, but this is where I live. Uh, as a matter of fact, this particular restaurant is not too far from my house. I've even seen people get married in front of this bar. It's just so beautiful. The shades of green, uh, spot on trend. It's very fun and happy, but still casual, but uh, but beautiful nonetheless. Uh, definitely keep Instagram in mind when you're designing a bar. So let's talk about overall design scheme. Uh, this is a shot of the uh, new design for Buffalo Wild Wings. Bit of trivia for you, the spec, at least the latest one that I've heard for Buffalo Wild Wings, uh, larger locations like this is for how many televisions? 100 wow so what are the key spatial features that inspire customers to stay in a place um, 
I'd like to show this particular image also because if you know your films, that is a still from The Shining, uh, which was filmed back, I believe, in I think it might have been the early 80s. But look at what you've got here in the design here. You've got an illuminated liquor display behind the bartender. And in front of the bartender, there's, there's also an illumination on the drink rail as well. What's old is new again. I'm absolutely seeing this used in a lot of locations. And think about the two slides that I previously showed you. They had an illuminated bar top, and they also had a beautifully illuminated space behind the bartender as well. So what are people looking for in a space? Well, uh, one thing they're absolutely looking for is high ceilings. Um, Tobin Ellis, who helped us create some of our most innovative uh, cocktail stations and underbar components, uh, actually helped me put this together and here's what he told me he called it the cathedral effect which I absolutely love that term uh, here's what he told me he said the high ceilings absolutely increase guest visit times and also allow for creative thinking interesting huh low ceilings will do the opposite of both I have to admit that there there's uh, two airports in the United States that have extremely low ceilings and every time I've had to fly through them I have felt that the ceiling was actually in fact pushing on me and it was all I could do to, to want to get on that plane as fast as possible because it was such an uncomfortable space. So I can absolutely agree with that sentiment there. So we're always looking for high ceilings. Makes you look up as well, don't you think? Um, Oh, and check out that beautiful beer tower on the, on the right there. That is from uh, Tupelo Honey Cafe. Light is also something that inspires people to uh, be happy in a space. We want to look for that medium light. Uh, that, that's the light that frankly makes all of us look really good. There is a bar in, I believe it's the Mandalay Bay uh, resort casino in Las Vegas that is completely red on the inside. It's, it's very much a vodka bar and all of the lighting in there is red. And if, boy, if you want to make people look absolutely stunning, put a lot of reddish tones of light on them. Uh, uh, you, you've never looked better, but then when you walk out, well, you're your same old self. Okay, what else inspires people to stay in a space? The right sound. Really not too quiet and not too loud. Um, you're looking for that sweet spot of, at or around 80 decibels. Uh, that That is the so sound level where things are convivial and joyful and fun, uh, but not so loud that you have to scream. I have a screenshot here on the left of an app that I've used on occasion, occasion called the Decibel X app. And that's a great piece to have uh, on, your, on your phone. So if someone is asking you about the noise level of a certain piece of equipment or a space, et cetera, you can easily pull that out and look like the smartest person in the room because you're able to very quickly determine how loud something is. And again, you're looking for a, the space at or around 80 decibels. What else inspires people to stay in a space? Uh, places that are not overly crowded. It's okay for them to be, like I said, uh, convivial, feel like a party, but you don't want to be jammed in there either. Uh, some people, particularly now, uh, we're going to probably want a little bit more personal space than usual. Uh, we've been planning 24 inches per customer at a bar at Perlick for a while. Uh, for a time there, Earlier uh, in the last decade, people were looking more at 18 inches, but really 24 inches is far more co comfortable. Also, it, it allows for dining at the bar. If you're going to be designing a facility where patrons may well be eating at the bar, which frankly, my favorite thing to do because it's a, the far more social, fun space, um, you definitely want to have 24 inches per person there. Now, interestingly enough, this is an image here from the Columbia Room, which is an award-winning bar in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is owned by a bartender, and his name is J.P. Featherstone, which is a cool name, too. Um, and the design of this place is actually something I would not recommend. Um, instead of having... Uh, I would always suggest doing a liquor display behind the bartender so you can sell, upsell your 
premium liquors, etc. Um, they've decided instead to put a mosaic here. But when, what I found out though was that the, the owners of this bar really wanted people to focus on what's going on with their cocktail. They spent a lot of time cultivating the right balance of ingredients for each one of their cocktails and they didn't want to take away from that with somebody saying well i want this drink but can you replace x with y uh as far as a branded you know bourbon or something like that uh and so to take that out of the equation um he instead put this beautiful mosaic up here so uh again this is a a james beard award-winning uh bar called the columbia room in washington dc check it out sometime it's lovely so let's talk a little bit about finished trends right now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, experience-driven design is, is a big part of, of what's going on currently. There is another webinar that I have on trends in restaurant and bar design pre and post COVID. Uh, I do a deeper dive into this uh, and some other uh, ideas as far as what's going on with, uh, with design in restaurants. Um, but a couple of finished trends that are definitely happening, uh, soft metallics, uh, something we would call feminine design, uh, things like lighter colors, uh, rounded edges, things like that. Um, certainly to me, mid-century modern and minimalist always looks wonderful. Uh, lighting that I mentioned before, greenery that I also mentioned before, again, uh, fresh and clean and green, definitely something to focus on. Uh, and retro finishes too. Um, hey y'all, wallpaper and brass are back. Um, not exactly the way that we had them in the 80s, thank goodness, when we were all going to Bennigan's, et cetera. But having um, uh, muted finishes like these and uh, actually large format wallpaper, super huge right now and uh, very interesting. Whenever I'm thinking about redesigning a room in my own house, I always look to the restaurants for inspiration. And I'll even take pictures and try to get some color samples as well, um, because that's where you're really going to see some terrific ideas. Okay, so how much space do you need for a bar? Uh, in general, a very broad brush stroke of it would say one bartender for every 50 people you're going to have in the facility on average. Um, and here's a couple of different designs and how much square feet uh, they require as well. Keep in mind though, when we're talking about people, customers, that's not only those seated at the bar, but also seated in the restaurant itself, as well as allowing for any sort of standing around as well. So if anything, you can, you, if you wanna over-design to perhaps, for perhaps the busiest part of your week, that makes a whole lot of sense. You can always pare that down during the less busy times by closing down one of the bartender stations. So as we all know, organization is critical for just about every occupation. Uh, here's a slide that I got from uh, OSHA that shows um, how we should have our, our, our workspaces designed. Be honest with you, I'm a stand-up desk kind of person. I don't know about you, um, but uh, I'm very comfortable standing. Um, but I've got a whole host of back problems in that, and I think actually standing is better uh, for all of us. Plus, it keeps me moving around. Um, but, uh, but maybe you're like this guy. Uh, boy, when I saw this, I showed it to my boyfriend and he, he wanted to put one of these in our garage, which would be great, but uh, we'd have no room for the cars. Um, but uh, love a great organized space like this. Same with kitchens, right? I know you folks probably already know this. Uh, and I fully recognize that this image was taken before anybody had even fried an egg on the grill here. It's extremely spotless. But as we all know, organization is absolutely critical for any occupation. And that's especially true of bartenders. Think about it. Bartenders have to do a lot of work in a very small space. And I'll say it now, and I'll say it probably a couple more times during this presentation but bartenders never ever ever have enough storage space for everything that they need to do their jobs uh the uh the one thing that i do want to emphasize again is that a profitable bar is absolutely critical to a restaurant's success and in 2020 that's going to be more important than ever um, as i stated before uh, bars are the major focal focal point of hospitality you also want to think about throughput goals. How many times are, is a bartender going to be able to make a cocktail in an hour? Should be about 100, frankly, maybe more. Um, 
and bars have to be balanced form with function without a doubt. And even though a lot of folks are not working at present in May 2020 behind bars, they will going forward. And let's be sure to design bars where the best bartenders will want to not only work, but will stay working. Some of the best bars that I've been to have bartenders that have been there many, many years. That's very unusual. But if you design a space and have the right management team, you're going to have a really happy group of people that are firing on all pistons and they're absolutely going to love their jobs. Health codes are always going to be critical. Definitely keep those in mind before you start designing a bar. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. In some of these slides, I do have a cocktail in the lower right corner. If you're interested in some of these recipes, uh, you can send me an email. I'll show you my email again at the very end here. This one is called a dancing leprechaun. And as you can imagine, it's got some fantastic Irish whiskey in it. Yum. One thing that Tobin Ellis also taught me is this. Nobody is making money when bartenders are walking around to make one drink. Oh, no. Really, zero step bartending should be the design goal. Now, I understand that that can't always happen. And designing bars is often a compromise between what can fit in the space and what kind of equipment is available, et cetera. But this is a perfect example of zero step bartending in this, uh, in this image right here. This is um, a really wonderful bar called the Libertine Social. It's in the Mandalay Bay uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, the bar owner here, his name is Tony Abuganum. He's the one that designed this. And I love how he does, he came up with this design. Frankly, it's not even anything we would have thought of at Perlick. Uh, you see here on, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here, you know, you've got the, the bartender's cockpit right here, several different kinds of ice. But then just to the right of that, he moved the liquor rack to the right. So all the bartender has to do is kind of lean just a teeny bit to pick up all these liquors. And then to the right of that is a dump sink, etc. And then right behind him is a refrigerator that has a lot of the refrigerated mixers, uh, garnishes, etc. So the bartender is basically just doing a little pivot to get everything that they need to create a cocktail. Really wonderful design. We always design bars from left to right, from clean to dirty. It's important to have those two zones clearly indicated in your design. Bartenders not only are always creating cocktails, but they're always cleaning up as well. So moving left to right here on this image that you see, on the left is where you've got clean glass and shaker pickup. Uh, you've also got your mixers, your fruits, your herbs, etc. The ice bin is always located right in front of the bartender. And we always put, if you're using a soda gun, we always put that on the left side of the ice chest. Now, why is that? Well, apologies to those of you who are left-handed, but 90% of us are right-handed. And so our strong hand is our right hand. And if you're designing a bar and you've got some very expensive bottles of liquor, you always want your bartender to manage those with their right strong hand. So what a bartender will do is they'll pick up, say, the, um, the bottle of Chopin vodka, very expensive, very tall bottle, a little wieldy to manage, uh, and, and be able to hold that and pour that out and use the, less, the, less, the lesser strong hand to handle the ingredients that are less expensive that it would not be as big of a deal if they were spilled. So exam for example, the soda gun or the, uh, the mixer, the storm pour, et cetera, that's, that's being used. So you want to design the bar from left to right, clean to dirty. Soda gun, though, got to always go on the left. Uh, again, your liquor, your liquor speed rail is in front. The speed rack or the liquor step, whatever you want to call it, is to the right of the ice bin. And then to the right of that is always where you put that dump sink in it. Uh, and in this design here, we've also got a dipper well for mixology tools. And then to the right of that is a dirty glass rack or bin for cleanup. This is a bit of a gross looking slide, I agree. Um, but I wanted to show you all of the things that a bartender needs within reach in order for him or sh him or her to create to do their job and not only to create drinks, but also to clean up. 
um, a lot of things in this end up getting missed. And we'll talk even a little bit more about other things that bartenders need that we don't always have uh, storage designed into the bar itself. Okay, so let's talk about some critical dimensions here. Um, the biggest thing, if you take anything out of this presentation, is the depth of from the bartender's hips to the edge of the drink rail must be 10 to 11 inches max. If you remember nothing else, please remember this dimension. Here's why. If we are standing and pouring, you know, again, that heavy bottle of Chopin, and we're perhaps pouring a bottle of tonic in with that as well, making a little vodka tonic for my friends. If that, if the bartender has to reach further than 11 inches, what they end up having to do is pitching at their hips, and that puts a terrible amount of undue strain on not only your a muscle called your erector spinae, which it go, runs along either side of your vertebra, um, but also your his his or her uh, lower back, hamstrings, and even the back of your knees for some strange reason. If any of you have ever had to pick up a child out of a crib, uh, and the child was in the back of the crib, you know that feeling. You have to pitch forward and pick up something rather heavy from that direction. Now imagine doing that for 40 hours a week extremely uncomfortable so please keep that in mind when you're designing bars um, so by this I mean and you're gonna get this that yes Perlick makes double speed rails I'm here to tell you please don't specify them unless all of the bartenders at this bar are going to be north of six foot tall uh, because for those of us that are not quite that tall it's extremely stressful on the body to reach over a double speed rail to try and make someone a cocktail and not be crabby doing it more critical dimensions at the bar. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but do understand that this information is available to you. If you would like, you're, you're welcome to take certainly screenshots of this, but if you would like these uh, dimensions in a document, I'm happy to send those to you. Again, my email will appear at the end of this presentation. The most important thing I want you to see, realize though when you're looking at this is that there's always more than one person running around in the bar. So you see the, the, the bartender there standing, but then you see someone standing right behind her is trying to get something off of a shelf. Or perhaps there's a, a bar back or a busser that is running around perhaps uh, refilling back bar refrigeration with more beer, more mixers, or adding more ice to ice bins that have gone too low, uh, et cetera. There's always a lot of action going on in bars, and we need to keep in mind that uh, if we can keep the, the dimensions in, a, in, a, in the same realm as uh, how we design kitchens and that things are going to be as low fatigue as possible, we need to allow space for that. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So each and every bar design should start with the cocktail station. Um, as, as Tobin likes to say, it's the center of the bartender's universe. It's where everything is being created and it's their workspace. Just like that first slide I showed you that was from OSHA that had uh, how a, a, a desk should be set up. Think about that. That's how you've got to design a bar as well, where everything is within arm's reach for that bartender. Um, oh, and by the way, there's a delicious looking tequila sunrise in the lower right there. Again, I'll send you these recipes if you'd like them. Okay, uh, ask your customers questions when you're designing the bar. These are two screenshots of two documents that I am happy to send to you. The one on the left is a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that uh, can actually do the math for you. So it's going to ask you things like the number of restaurant seats, the number of bar, bar seats, etc., to help you decide how many cocktail stations you need. Um, the document on the right is actually a two-page document that has a lot of really important questions to ask when you're designing a bar, um, whether you're talking to the designer or you're talking to the bar manager or the restaurant owner, they should have a pretty good idea of most of these answers. And again, if you email me, I'm happy to send both of these documents to you. Uh, although they say Perlick on the top, you are welcome to add your own logo, uh, make this your own document. Happy to do that. We, we are not uh, being, um, uh, I don't know, 
and uh, sensitive about that. I'm happy to share all this information with you guys. Okay, so let's go through the cocktail station components again. So here on both of these here, you've got the far more ergonomic uh, Tobin Ellis bartender cockpit on the left. And then on the right is kind of more the standard type of, of bar equipment that we've been producing for years. At the center of all of that is the ice chest that's outlined in red. Uh, and then you see both in front and to the right of that ice chest is is the speed rail as well as the liquor step or what we call the speed rack on the uh, Tobin Ellis line up there. That holds all your liquors, key things, right? Uh, to the left of the ice chest uh, on the uh, setup on the left there is uh, a jockey box or a little ice well for mixers, things like store and pours, uh, bottles of juice, etc. On the uh, design on the, on the right has the soda gun manifold. Again, always on the left. Always on the left. So what's the most exciting part of the bar? Oh, I think you know what it is. It's the drain board, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, no, it's not. But the reason why I mentioned that is because when you've got any extra space in a bar, just stick a drain board in there with some storing, storage underneath. Because if you don't do that, what's it's going to end up being a repository for rags perhaps the bartender's purse uh etc you, you might just see just a bunch of detritus tossed somewhere now i, I rec fully recognize that the image that you're seeing right now that's not super neat either um there in that rack there there are some check presenters there's some backup paper for the pos uh system etc but understand the bartender is managing so many different things and they never ever have enough storage space for these types of things. My suggestion is to always add storage components wherever you can. And if you don't want to see them, we can certainly put doors on everything so they are hidden. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more later about things like delivery and carry out service. Often that falls to the bartender. And where are you going to store all that stuff? Where are you going to store the paper menus or the uh, bags for delivery? Or where are you going to stage the, uh, the guys that are coming to pick up the orders because they're actually doing the delivery for your restaurant, etc. cetera? Um, so think about always adding extra storage space for those bartenders, both vertically and horizontally. You can also add drain boards to the top of refrigeration. A lot of folks do this. I highly recommend it. Um, I love these bar mats. Um, these, that the image here on the lower right is from uh, a, a really lovely country club. And you can see they've got loads of different kinds of glassware that they have uh, for their cocktails. Most of it is not stackable. So they need to find extra horizontal space to store all their glassware. We can add drain boards to the top of refrigeration like you see on the uh, upper left there. That is the um, uh, BBS 36C that automatically comes with a drain board on top with options for a cutting board. So I understand this is not everybody thinks this is exciting, but dump sinks are absolutely critical. People can share a hand sink. It's a little tougher to share a dump sink, uh, but again, bar, as I mentioned before, bartenders are, are very uh, flexible, ambidextrous people. Um, they can always work around a situation, but if you have the space to add a dump sink for every single bartender's station, please do it. And again, locate that to the right of the clean area, left to right, clean to dirty. Also be sure to always include a strainer for each and every dump sink. Nothing will shut down a bar faster than a dump sink that has a clogged drain. If you think about it, that's going to that's going to slow the entire business down. I have been to bars where the dump sink is out of out of commission and bartenders have to resort to dumping things into 5-gallon buckets on the floor. Not a very appealing sight, right? Uh, so always be sure to specify a strainer for a dump sink. Uh, it can be something that comes from the manufacturer. It could be something that is simply a buyout item. Always include a strainer with every dump sink. Also not so exciting, but, assent but absolutely essential these days are hand sinks. Uh, we're going to see a lot more hand sinks being required in many locations uh, after COVID. 
Personally, I like to see a, a hand washing sink at the beginning of or at the entrance to every bar, uh, if that for that for the servers to use, for the bartenders to use, etc. Uh, you see this one here on the left is has also got side splashes on them. I suspect we're going to see more and more um, requirements for side splashes for hand sinks. Hand sinks are going to be required not only back of the house, front of the house, you may even see them further on uh, outside of the front of the house area for both patrons and staff to use at a restaurant. Just my thought. Um, but I'm a, as somebody who has a degree in public health and really hasn't used it, I sell bar equipment for a living after all. Um, but I've always been a big fan of hand washing and uh, you should be too and take advantage of any hand sink that you see. Um, also, I don't have it mentioned on this slide here, but uh, things like touchless faucets are going to be something we're going to see a lot more going forward. Okay, let's talk about trash. Uh, absolutely not exciting but absolutely critical is planning space for trash uh, personally I like a trash unit uh, that's what you see over on the left here that is just a very simple piece of, of underbar equipment that just saves the space for the trash can um, you can plan for that space but sometimes that'll end up getting uh, moved or squished out uh, it, which i've seen in a number of uh, situations very simple uh, most everyone is using those slim jim uh, trash cans uh, if you've got to add recycling to that you want to double up on that obviously as well um, we can also make that trash unit with a complete door that goes all the way down if no one wants to see the trash can also remember i said before about how um, Bartenders never have enough space for all of the things that they need. Look at the center image here. On top of the trash can, you see there's a whole stack of check presenters. Again, some paper menus and some other stuff there as well. Uh, uh, as I said before, there's never enough space in a bar, and bartenders will take advantage of any uh, horizontal space that you give them. So, again, just I'm an advocate for my pals who are the bartenders, please um, give them as much storage space possibly can. Here's what happens when you don't plan for garbage. I took all of these photos and the, the one that probably makes me the most sad is the one in the upper left. This is a wonderful restaurant that I absolutely enjoy. The owner of this place is really into wine and serving wine in a lot of different formats and he decided to uh, serve wine on tap as part of that. Wine and kegs. Right now you can get more than 500 different labels of wine in stainless steel kegs and if you think about it it's actually first of all it's much more eco-friendly because you're not talking about garbage and and waste and things like that but it also protects the wine better because the, the wine is not exposed to light and it's also not exposed to as many extreme temperature changes once that wine is delivered it's kept stable at the right temperature um, i'm happy to show this the, that image has one of our uh, dzs 60 units that's set for red and white wine um, but again this picture makes me sad why because if you work at that bar and you're pouring me a, a glass of pinot noir or something you've actually got to reach over that garbage can to fill up my glass uh, and imagine having to do that for i don't know maybe 20 or 30 percent of your day uh, it's not very pleasant um, and also as a customer it looks bad as it does with these other two photos as well the image on the lower right i took at a very very nice outdoor resort bar by the pool uh, and you know having a smart cocktail but then you look and i see that garbage right there the space clearly wasn't planned for trash uh, so definitely always keep in mind where you're going to have the trash going um, and probably the more the better really Okay, so let's talk a little bit about back bar refrigeration. I love back bar refrigeration. Why? Uh, it keeps everything cold. Um, okay, so hey, what, what do you think the ideal space between the front bar and the back bar refrigeration should be? It should be 36 to 40 inches. Pay attention to what your local health department regulations are. Chances are at the minimum is 36 inches. Now, I understand that sometimes you don't have that much space. 
sometimes you're working with a historical building that has this wonderful vintage bar and it was it was put in place when I don't people were a lot thinner back then perhaps and there's just the space just isn't simply there so what do you do in that situation the good news is is that there are options for back bar refrigeration that can work in a tighter space you've got a uh, this this unit on the left is called a BBR 48 it is a remote back bar refrigerator that has sliding doors which is pretty cool so obviously zero clearance bartenders like sliding doors a lot too because they automatically close um, and to be really honest with you I've seen bartenders kick this thing open pull out a bottle of beer and it just closes automatically and they're happy as can be because they don't have to actually use their hand to open it they bartenders will use their feet to do certain tasks as well so keep that in mind uh, the um, the the uh, unit on the lower right there is a narrow door back bar refrigerator and narrow door is nice because it's only got a 19 inch swing a standard back bar refrigerator swing is 24 inches five inches might not seem like a lot but uh, if you recall that image that I showed you earlier um, of all of the different um, dimensions you've also got lots of people walking behind the bartender as well so five inches is is an often enough space to prevent the again the bar back from not bumping into the bartender while he or she is working etc so that uh, that narrow door swing might be just a, a perfect idea now uh, just about every keg from the United States will still fit inside of one of these narrow back bar units uh, with the exception of some of the bubble kegs that are used by um, European beer companies um, also Coors does occasionally still use those bubble kegs and their larger um, kegs of beer as well and you might have a little bit of a challenge getting those into but otherwise um, just about every every other keg will easily fit into a narrow door back bar okay so let's do a little recap here what do we got going on so again at the center of your universe of the of the uh, battle bridge for the bartender is that cocktail station now next to that cocktail station to the right again we're going to the right so left to right clean to dirty is that dump sink with strainer uh, one thing I will point out too with that strainer is that uh, here in the front I'll use my cursor here you can see this is actually a cocktail shaker rinser so simply to knock out just any extra um, uh, bits of mint and sugars and things like that that it can accumulate inside a shaker it's not going to clean the shaker it's just going to rinse it uh, and then to the right of that this is actually a variable depth dipper well for the mixology tools okay and then over here is a trash unit for a slim jim trash can uh, and we'll expand exactly where that's located it's at the beginning of the bar this is a hand sink that's located at the entrance so very nice though if you're a uh, wait staff walking up perhaps you picked up two bottles of beer on your way out you can pop those into the trash receptacle and wash your hands at this and when you're finished with that very simple here we've got back bar refrigeration this one's located 42 inches from the front bar um, so uh, a little bit longer than what we suggest but still doable anything much longer though than 42 inches bartenders gonna have to take more than a step to get back to that back bar and anytime a bartender has to take extra steps that's time wasted and that's profitability wasted uh, again good bartenders can easily make more than 100 drinks in an hour and, and anything that slows them down is going to slow down not only their ability to make money but also the restaurant's profitability as well you always want to duplicate and not mirror cocktail stations uh, I see a lot of designs that are done by architects and interior designers and they like to mirror things and I can understand why because things that are symmetrical that are mirrored are very aesthetically pleasing uh, it looks nice however it doesn't always work if you're the person actually inside of the equipment itself a good comparison to that would be cars you know here in North America we drive on the right side of the road and where we sit in our car we sit on the in the left seat uh, imagine going to England where we're doing ex the exact opposite now it shouldn't be a problem right it's the same components just in a different configuration right well it's quite a quite a challenge uh, right so what you want to do is always 
copy and do the exact same setup for every cocktail station you can so that a bartender who comes into service no matter which uh, cocktail station he or she is working at they know where everything is located and they've got I don't like using the word muscle memory but they've already got that flow state going where they know where everything's located so that they're able to engage with their customers while they're making a cocktail and not worrying about picking up or or setting uh, down an item in the wrong space. So again, you wanna plan for your busiest rush. As I said it before, at an extra cocktail station, you can always uh, shut one of them down during less busy times. Um, I also mentioned here, be sure to adhere to health department requirements for glass washing. I do mention that because I think we're going to see more and more uh, glass washers required behind the bar and not so much the three. So this is what that bar started out looking as. Now, <laughs> we, I, hopefully you can come up with something that's a little bit more uh, clever for us, a little, you know, has a little more detail, but I understand we can help you with that as well at Perlick. And it still makes me laugh when I see this. Um, so here's a couple of cool designs that I came across that I thought I'd share with you. This bar features a VIP section. You access this VIP section. It's actually elevated. It's kind of hard to tell here, but if I use my cursor, this is the stairs leading up to this VIP section. You can rent this VIP section out. It's actually very close to the kitchen uh, door as well. Uh, a bartender will come up there, make you some perhaps some unique cocktails, and the chef can come out with a tasting menu for you as well. I don't know. That sounds like a great idea for me and my friends. This is what it looks like. I, uh, there is, um, at this restaurant, there is a balcony and I was able to get up there and take this picture down here. Pretty neat, huh? I uh, thought that was nice. I think we're gonna see some more clever usages of this. Um, particularly in a post-COVID world, people are gonna perhaps wanna have some more somewhat private spaces and maybe this fills that. Uh, this is a great example of a very, just a very classic uh, sports bar lineup. Sports bars are almost always island bars. They're usually very large bars uh, that have multiple stations and a lot of bottle coolers too for a lot of beer. This is one I really like and, and one of our uh, sales engineers absolutely demanded that I include this in the presentation. And what this is, is this is actually a curved bar but it's still rectilinear behind it, which I love. Uh, those of you that love to design round bars, um, oh, it's really hard because guess what? Nobody makes round bar equipment unless it's all custom fabricated, and which can be extremely expensive. So a nice way to accomplish some sexy curves in a bar is to have the top be curvy, but everything behind it for the bartenders and the barbacks, et cetera, is rectilinear as always. It's also a much less expensive way to achieve the same uh, curvy design. We've got big changes coming at Perlick. Um, I think you're gonna hear about those in the coming months. We're doing a complete redesign of all of our underbar equipment, not only to make them uh, more appealing and aesthetically uh, pleasing, but also very durable and extremely sanitary. Uh, sanitation and durability are the two overriding design principles of everything that we build at Perlick. And so be on the lookout for some more nifty things coming from Perlick in your future. Uh, I love showing this picture at the end here. <laughs> this, uh, this is actually a friend of Tobin Ellis's in, uh, I believe he's in Las Vegas as well, and uh, just showing all of the things that bartenders have to do to accomplish uh, their job. Um, bartenders, as I said before, are some of the most ambidextrous people I've seen. They can do a lot of work uh, just like a piano player can with their right hand and their left hand doing completely different things. Um, uh, they're amazing people, so let's let's show them the love with some great bar design. Uh, you can always contact me for the information that I've got listed here, as well as those recipes uh, for the cocktails that you saw on here. And uh, be sure to um, be sure to send me a note when you can. Um, one thing I always like to finish with too is this. This is an image from. Uh, Perlick's first location. Um, my company's been around since 1917. We have lived and worked through several wars, um, the Great Depression, Prohibition, thank goodness that's not around anymore, uh, and many other difficult things. 
do know that we're open today. We're here to help you. Um, we look forward to doing business with you. If you've got any questions at all, please give me or any of our wonderful Perlick representatives across North America a ring, and we're so happy to help you. If you've got any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact me. Here is my uh, email address. Again, it's corinne.walenda at perlick.com. And I thank you for your time. Take care. Cheers.